same general area where four sets of remains, you remember they were found last fall in these burlap bags, then another body was found. That's correct, but much more. A remote beach, that beach turned burial ground. I was effective at it. Long Island. Since December, as many as eight bodies have been found. On a I think it's taught me more about how to understand people. Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we are going to talk about a story uh, I initially covered years and years ago, but has recently had some huge updates, and I've also gotten like about a million messages from y'all, so thanks for that. So I think we can all agree it is definitely time to talk about the Gilgo Beach Killer, aka the Long Island Serial Killer, aka Rex Hurman, allegedly. This case, since I covered it, it's always been one that stuck with me. In fact, I wasn't really too sure it would ever be solved. But look, good news, here we are, and isn't that just great? Allegedly, this 59-year-old married father of two, has his own architecture business in Midtown Manhattan, is responsible for tree deaths. And it's widely believed, a hell of a lot more. So, you and I, let's take a look at what we looked at before, but with immense updates, and it could be coming to a solved very soon. Let's give it a go. On the south side of Long Island, over an hour's drive from Midtown Manhattan, lies Gilgo Beach. It's kind of a lonely, desolate area. On one side, the mighty Atlantic. On the other, small bays and salt marshes. And it was there, hidden from the beach by the Ocean Parkway, uh, up to 11, some, some even say up to 18 bodies were found over a 15 year period, hidden away in, in the underbrush. Since 1996, up to 18 sets of human remains have been found along this one desolate beach, across a tree mile area. All are unsolved and many remain unidentified, though four victims, at least, may finally be getting justice. The most recent body was found in 2011. But this case really began in 2010. That's when the Long Island serial killer emerged and became known. It began with the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert. 24-year-old Shannon Gilbert was originally from Pennsylvania, but moved with her mother and her siblings to New York after her parents separated. She worked a number of odd jobs before ending up in sex work. Shannon, as a youth, had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and had a history of drugs abuse. She had been assaulted and needed a titanium plate in her jaw. So, well, sex work was a way to pay the bills. Yet she was taking online college courses in hopes of starting fresh somewhere else. It was on May 1st, 2010, that Shannon was dropped off at a client's house by her driver, a guy named Michael Pack, and the, the client's house was just down the road from Gilgo Beach. Shannon and her client, uh, Joseph Brewer, they had arranged a date on Craigslist. But, um, you know, after arriving, Shannon, she was apparently acting very erratically. And uh, at about 4.51 a.m., which was about three hours after she arrived, Shannon dialed 911. Yeah, there's somebody asking me. I'm sorry? There's somebody asking me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. Okay, where are you? There's somebody after me. Where are you, ma'am? I don't know. Somebody's after me. Please. Are you in Suffolk County or Nassau County? Um, I'm in Long Island. Where on Long Island are you? Stop. Please. Stop it, please. Please stop. Okay. Michael, Michael, what's the matter? Are you okay? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? The call is weird. She's extremely disoriented. Maybe on something, maybe having uh, you know, some sort of mental health issue. Whatever the situation, things were not good. She'd make a couple more 911 calls. She would run outside of this Joseph Brewer guy's house. She would be banging on neighbors' doors before eventually vanishing into the night. On May 3rd, her family filed a missing persons report. The two men who were there that night, Joseph Brewer and Michael Pack, they were investigated, they were polygraphed, but they were neither were ever named suspects in whatever happened happened to Shannon. 
Both would say, you know, nothing bad happened. She just began behaving really strangely and ran off by herself. Didn't have a clue what she was on about. It's like she just lost the plot and vanished. That's what they say happened. Police back at the beach hoping today would be the day that they actually find the remains of Shannon Gilbert. It was while searching for Shannon months later in, in December 2010. I mean, the searches had basically died down, but uh, one officer and his canine unit were out in that general area training and training and searching kind of at the same time. But the first body was found. He was walking along with his canine when the dog suddenly got the scent of a human cadaver. They found one over the next few days, another, and another, and so on. Four bodies have turned up on a Long Island beach, police beginning a wide-ranging search for clues. Police say three of the bodies badly decomposed. This discovery followed skeletal remains found days earlier. More searches would be done, more bodies found, including Shannon's, eventually, in December 2011. With so many bodies found in such close proximity, the Long Island serial killer case began. Some of the bodies would be identified, others still to this day remain unknown. Some, like Shannon, the cause of death is undetermined. It's believed that four of the victims found, the first four are definitely, definitely linked, and they're known as the Gilgo Beach Four. They were discovered in December 2010, in close proximity, and their bodies were in similar positions, bound at the wrists or ankles, covered in burlap sacks and such, and it appeared those four had been dumped out of a car they were so close to the road. They were Maureen Brainerd Barnes, 25 years old, Melissa Bartholomew, 24 years old, Megan Waterman, 22, and Amber Costello, 27. All were sex workers, all similar looking, similar builds, all petite, the tallest 5'5", the shortest 4'10", and all had been in contact with someone via a burner phone shortly before they disappeared, and all were strangled to death. Maureen Brainerd Barnes was originally from Connecticut. She worked as an escort on Craigslist and was last seen in July 2007. Melissa Bartholomew, from New York, went missing in July 2009. A week after Melissa went missing, her younger sister, a teenager, Amanda, she began receiving calls from someone. Calls that were, you know, from a burner phone, that were threatening, that were vulgar. Asking if Amanda was a, was a whore like her sister, saying that he assaulted and murdered Melissa and was watching her body rot. Megan Waterman was from Maine, like the others, a, an escort on Craigslist, and she went missing in June 2010. She'd been staying at a motel not far from Gilgo Beach at the time. And finally, Amber Costello, she was from the New York area, from a town just 10 miles from Gilgo Beach. She disappeared in 2010. Right now, based on, uh, you know, the common denominators, uh, the similarities of the victims, where they were dumped, the dismemberment, uh, you know, it looks like one person. This case is not cold. Uh, you know, I don't like that term because it indicates that we've given up on it and that it's put in a file drawer someplace. Uh, not true. And I tell people all the time that uh, when we do catch the person, everybody will be surprised. The case of the Long Island serial killer is one of those cases that probably could have been solved like years earlier if only they'd like gotten you know, their asses into gear. In fact, once the investigators did get their ass you know, into gear, they, they found a suspect relatively quickly. They had descriptions of the suspect and vehicles that had sat in dusty filing cabinets for over a decade, just laying there, not making any progress on the case at all. Things did slow down the case. You probably know what they are. Incompetence and corruption. The Suffolk County Police Chief at the time of the discovery of the bodies was one James Burke. And guess what? He was arrested in 2015 and later convicted of beating the ever-living shite out of a suspect who had stolen out of James Burke's car uh, cigars, sex toys and a big old bag of porn. Cigars and sex toys is a damn good Saturday night. There was a big old cover-up of this, of course, that would eventually land the DA in prison, and a conviction for the county's top anti-corruption prosecutor. Can we just assume that everybody who is, like, involved in anti-corruption is... you can just scratch out the ante? And during all this time, you know, during the first good couple of years, the FBI were continually asking, hey, do you wanna, do you want like, a dig out? You know, do you want a bit of a hand on the old Gilgo Beach? Long Island serial killer case, by any chance, to which James Burke and the Suffolk County police would respond, eh, no. Probably because of the whole kind of corruption thing, so, yeah. 
Now, over the years, there had been a number of suspects, including one John Bitrolf, who, when I covered this, score, this story before, I, I was kind of pretty set on that he was involved. Look who's the fucking idiot now, this guy. The Suffolk County prosecutor was pointing at him, and he already had been convicted of murdering two sex workers and suspected of a third murder. He also lived like only three miles from Gilgo Beach, and he was a hunter and a carpenter, so he kind of like fit fit the bill. Another suspect was a Peter Hackett, who was a neighbor of Joseph Brewer. Joseph Brewer was Shannon's client she was with the night she disappeared. Peter was a former doctor, and so he specialized in biology, if you catch my drift. He was literally a doctor. But yeah, after Shannon disappeared, Shannon's mother, uh, who would later pass away, um, she would say she, this Peter Hackett guy was calling her all the time. Called her multiple times saying, oh, he had Shannon and he was taking real good care, care of her. When confronted with this, Peter would say, I never called Shannon's mother, ever. Phone records would, you know. Also, some of Shannon's belongings were found just outside his home. There were a couple of suspects. Even James Burke, the police chief, was one of the listed suspects at the time. Apparently, he was very violent with a couple of sex workers. So, so there were a number of suspects and a psychological profile of who the Gilgo Beach killer was. You know, a psychological profile was done. And experts would say the person responsible was likely a, a white male in his mid-twenties to mid-forties, educated, has an expensive truck or car, is married, is employed. Not like some kind of weird, oh, kind of, you know, who you typically think like a killer would be. No, somebody who just blends in. Um, somebody, you know, who you wouldn't expect could be your neighbor, someone who's maybe even charming and disarming. He would have to be. But largely, the case of Lisk, it went ice cold. So then, let's uh, get to when this haunting case started cooking with gas. And it all began with a new administration, a new chief of police, a new uh, police administrator. And remember that phone call? The one Melissa Bartholomew's younger sister Amanda got saying, you know, asking if she was a whore and saying he was watching Melissa's body rot. Well, a number of phone calls actually would be traced to burner phones. I mean, the call to Amanda was clearly seemed like it was made from the guy. And so then they start tracking down all these burner phones and where the calls, you know, to the victims, where those burner phone calls had been made. That was the main port of call for this new administration, investing in this new technology which was coming out and working with other agencies making friends with the FBI once again to try and narrow this down. They were, slowly, over time, able to determine that the burner phones used to contact the victims, well, calls had been made from the burner phones in two specific areas. One was Midtown Manhattan, specifically the area around Madison Square Garden and Penn Station. Those calls were made during the day. At night, calls were made from a place called Massapequa Park. Massapequa Park is a residential area in southern Long Island, half hour's drive from Gilgo Beach. Funnily enough, it's like an area that's already kind of associated with horror and with murder because the next town over is Amityville. So that's where the calls from these burner phones you know, were being made. And, you know, not just to the victims, but to the victims' relatives. And logically, from the times when the calls were made, he worked in Midtown Manhattan, he lived in Massapequa. Not that you know, knowing that made it any easier, you know, New York, it's... Have you heard? It's a little bit kind of populated. It's a little bit big. Fair few f***ers live there. But when combined with some of the statements this new team began to unearth from dusty old filing cabinets, then you can start to build something. The day before Amber Costello disappeared, September 1st, 2010, a call was made from a burner phone around Massapequa Park. That same day, a client showed up at Amber's address in West Babylon, New York. Now, this client, this John, he's gonna have a little bit of a trick, a little bit of a hoo-ha played on him by Amber and one of Amber's friends. See, the client will go in, pay Amber up front for some services, and then, just as they were gonna get, you know, down to business, Amber's friend would burst in, pretending to be Amber's boyfriend, saying, whoa, what's this? Then he chases this John client out. Right, and then they, you know, make off with the money. Well, that's exactly what happened. The client walked in, Amber's friend then burst in shortly afterward, pretending to be her boyfriend. The client said, whoa, I'm just a friend. I'm just a friend over here. Busting a nut? You must be joking. I should leave. He did so. But then the client, he, he later contacted uh, Amber via the burner phone, asking for credit for next time. The next time would be the next day when Amber disappeared. A description, though, of this client was, well... An ogre was how one person described him. 
big white guy, like 250 pounds, 6'4 to 6'6, big like 70s glasses and dark bushy hair. He also, and this is important, drove a Chevrolet Avalanche. The fact that this suspect drove a Chevrolet Avalanche is something that sat in the folders for over a decade. So, the police began searching for a Chevrolet Avalanche and the names linked to them, and many would come up. One was Rex Hurmans. Who? Yes, ogre. Yeah, Shrek. It's also it's insulting to Shrek. Of course he is an ogre. 59 years of age, which also would have put him in his 40s when the crimes occurred. Now, the name Rex Hurman had not been mentioned once, ever, before his name came up in March 2022. Only when they were looking up who owned Chevrolet Avalanches in the area did he come, did he come up. So then they were like, okay, he drives the same vehicle that somebody saw near the day before one of the victims disappeared. He looks like a f***ing ogre. What else do we know about him? Well, he was a wealthy architect, of course, who had founded Rex Hurman Consultants and Associates, Inc., based in Midtown Manhattan. He was even captured on Google Street View. Incorporated in 1994, he had extensive experience with New York City's building code and worked with all sorts of names you'd know, like Nike, American Airlines, Target, Foot Locker, apartment buildings, all sorts. He also lived in Massapequa Park, just across the bay from Gilgo Beach. Beach. Well, color me fucking intrigued, lads. In fact, he, pre he hit like pretty much every ding on the original profile of the serial killer. They began investigating his online activity and found he had a penchant for sex workers, Tinder accounts, fake email addresses with fake names to accompany them, and disturbing ass internet searches. Think of the most disturbing things? That's what he was looking up. Very disturbing porn, violent sexual assault, kids. Yeah, all that. And when the investigation into the Gilgo Beach killings, you know, was in its infancy, in its infancy, um, they, they had found back of the day hairs on some of the bodies, on some of the burlap sacks, on some of the duct tape that was used to bind some of the victims, but back then, they, they couldn't get any information from the hairs, the DNA, the technology wasn't there. That was back at that time, back in, you know, 2010-ish. Times have changed. Going through his trash and pizza boxes he discarded outside of work, a lot of the hairs found at the crime scene were, well, found to have come from Rex Hewerman's wife. One, most definitely, from him. And then... Bombshell tonight! Rex Hewerman was arrested on July 13th, 2023, as he left his office for the evening. Rex, did you do it? 13 years in the making and investigators are confident that they have this guy. Interestingly, it seemed like either Rex knew they were coming for him or he was going to strike again very, very soon. In the like 14 to 16 months before he was arrested in July 2023, he had done over 200 internet searches of the Gilgo Beach killer and the Long Island serial killer. He was fascinated with, um, allegedly, himself. He also had been visiting escorts again. He also, and this is worrying, had been trying to track down one of the kids of one of his alleged victims. Rex was found to have been uploading selfies from the burner phone. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a gotcha if you're actually uploading pictures of yourself. Well, it's kind of hard to prove that, you know, they're not yours. These selfies were, by the way, for sex workers. Hey, babe, like what you see? He was also seen on CCTV in stores paying for more minutes. And he would use the name Andy Roberts as his name linked to the burner phone. Also Tinder and email addresses. It's really like the progress of technology that made this case kind of solvable. How they were able to track down the phones and where they were used and where the burner phones were used and where Rex's actual like phone in his name was. And they would those two phones would travel together so that's how they were able to definitively link them two together and then you combine it with the hair that the DNA was found to be unusable back in the day over you know 10-15 years ago. Now it's hella usable. Still though, I mean, the fact that they had a description of him and a description of his vehicle just languishing in a drawer for almost a decade and it was never followed up on, I mean, come on now. From his online records, he looked up plenty of articles about the Long Island serial killer, fascinated. So he was, and he also looked up, as I said, some very sick shit. 
Now, Rex Hureman has pleaded not guilty to all the charges. That's murder in the first and second degree of Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, and Melissa Bartholomew. He has not been charged with, although he is suspected of, the murder of the fourth Gilgo victim, Maureen Brainard Barnes. I did hear the district attorney uh, outline his case. I will say to you folks that it's extremely circumstantial in nature. Uh, in terms of speaking to my client, the only thing I can tell you that he did say uh, as he was in tears was, I didn't do this. Uh, we obviously don't have any evidence. This is the beginning of the case. Everybody is presumed innocent in our country. Uh, there's a presumption of innocence, and uh, we're looking forward to fighting this case in a court of law, not in the, in the court of press. Now, since his arrest, uh, fascinating tidbits about Rex Hureman, this married father of two, have come out. First of all, his house, right? You think, this lad, hotshot architect in Midtown Manhattan, must be raking it in. Mansion, right? Wrong. His house is a real shithole. His house was described as the eyesore of the neighborhood. It is, in fact, Rex's childhood home. Now, the police would learn, and this is all in the, the arresting affidavit, that when he killed the three victims he's been charged with, at that time, his wife was out of town. She was out of New York when those three people were killed. She was either, you know, in Maryland or in Iceland, or she just wasn't home. So that's why police believe that, you know, after he contacted them on Craigslist, talking to them via the burner phone, went to pick them up, he brought he likely brought them back to his house and killed them there. Then he dumped them in Gilgo Beach, which is not far. Yeah, seemed like he gave his neighbor, uh, his neighbors the creeps. His was the house you tell your kids not to trick or treat at. One neighbor uh, when asked, like, are you shocked, you know, to hear your neighbor, your longtime neighbor is, you know, a, a possible serial killer? Does that surprise you? Well, one said, and I quote, I wasn't surprised at all, because of all the creepiness. That'll do it. 300 guns have been removed from the home. He had licenses for less than half that. I mean, it's not surprising though that his house was the creepy house when you see some of the creepy shit that was, that's been removed from, from the house, uh, including, you know, a creepy child encased, a creepy child's doll encased in glass, or the portrait of a disfigured woman. That's almost as unnerving as his wig. His wife has since filed for divorce because apparently if the creepy dolls just weren't like the straw that broke the camel's back. Kind of feels like it should have been. Now co-workers, you know, uh, ar architecture buddies would say he was nice, he was sociable. Others would say he was creepy and unsettling. His job uh, taught you about yourself. I think it's taught me more about how to understand people and how you deal with the people, I think, is one of the more interesting aspects that have come out of this. Yes. He had a habit of bringing up the, Gil the Gilgo murders, uh, a number of people said, like, a lot. Like, out of the blue. Like, oh yeah, building a new building. Ugh, cool. Um, Gilgo Beach murders, anyone? Want to talk about it? Though, personally, I find that quite relatable. He was also a bit of an ambulance chaser, like the worst kind of litigious, like the reason your insurance is so high. Over the past 10 years, he filed at least four personal injury lawsuits against drivers, seeking, altogether, about 20 milli. The defendants claiming he exaggerated or staged the heck out of his claims. He's also years late in paying hundreds of thousands in taxes. Really weird guy, Rex is. I mean, other than the whole, you know, possible serial killer thing. Uh, he was once kicked out of a Whole Foods for stealing fruit. Like, he walked in and they had left out clementines in a little bowl near the entrance of the store, like, for the kids to have. And he just, well, don't mind if I do. There was a lot more than just the Gilgo 4, of which he's been tar charged with three. You know, found on Gilgo Beach, 11, at least, bodies out there. So who knows if he will be charged with more, even more outside of New York. Um, they're looking into to four sex workers who were found murdered near Atlantic City. Um, the cases in Las Vegas, or in South Carolina, where he owns property. After 12 days, the search at Rex Hureman's home ended. At this time, not much has been revealed other than the, well, soundproof vault in his basement, but no bones or bodies. So far, anyway. As I said at the top, you know, many other victims have been found at Gilgo, at Gilgo Beach, some whose identities are unknown, and you also have people like you know, the, fa the most famous case, which is Shannon Gilbert, and her case is still unsolved, and her cause of death is still undetermined. 
whether those cases will ever be solved, whether there is even more killers out there, or Rex Hurman is responsible for a lot of them, remains to be seen. I hope I said allegedly enough in this, because he hasn't been found convicted of or found guilty of anything quite just yet. So better make sure I kind of do that. But if I haven't, bombshell tonight! Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you being here with me watching this whole video. Uh, means a lot. It means a lot as always. Um, yeah. Listen, I guess that kind of wraps up this one. So, uh, see you real soon in the next little video. I'm coming in a couple of days, so, you know, give it a give. But until then, please take care of each other and yourselves, because guess what? I love ya. My gift.